Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Woo! Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Yeah, I just want to just want to wait on the Lord for a moment. Let's just invite Holy Spirit just to rest on us even as we're in worship, uh, that our hearts will be open for the word, uh, that our hearts would be good ground, good soil, uh, so that the word that goes forth would bear much fruit um, in our life. I just want to say there's always um, a responsibility not only on the preacher, but on the hearers to actually hear the word and be prepared to do something with it. And um, so, Father, we just pray, open our hearts this morning. You know, I just feel like, um, just wanted to, just as I, before I got up here, just wanted to say, Jesus is worth the wait. Jesus is worth the wait. I feel like, you know, when you're suffering, when you're struggling, when you're really waiting for God to do something, um, that is the time where he's testing you. That is the time where he is stretching your faith. That is the time where he is refining you. Um, and not to um, succumb to your circumstance, but to stand on his promise, to trust what he has said. And I just want to encourage you that if you're in that space right now, if there's someone in the room who's in that space right now where you're really waiting on the Lord and it's like, God, I really need you to show up right now, um, just to remember what he said to you, that in the season prior to what you're going through, he's already given you a promise. He's already given you a promise. Um, hold firm without wavering. He is able to perform what he has said. If you receive that, just say amen. amen. Yeah, he's able to do it. Hallelujah. Well, listen, it's my joy to be here this morning. My name is George Matthew Clash, lead pastor here at The Crossing. For those who don't know, I want to welcome those who are watching online. Bless you. The Lord be with you. Um, it's my joy to bring the word today. And we're going to continue in our School of the Spirit series. Who's been enjoying this? Who's been enjoying learning some of these foundational lessons that the Spirit of God is going to bring us through? And what I love is that um, learning the ways of God, learning the, the, the path that the Lord brings us on is that it's not linear. Um, a lot of times we think it's just going to be like, you know, point A to point B. Uh, but you kind of go from point A to point Z to point D. You kind of go all the way around. There's this securitist route that God brings us on as he is maturing us in our faith. And it kind of looks more like concentric circles. Feels like you're going to go down right before you're going to go up. And this is something we need to be aware of so that, again, we'll learn how to partner with the Lord in whatever, port, uh, whatever point we find ourselves in, um, in those twists and turns of following Jesus. Uh, there are patterns of what the Lord will do in our life to make us more Christ-like, and they're similar in every season because I am of the mind that at the root of our sinfulness, at the root of our uh, being marred by sin, there are, there, there's a particular thing that's, that the Lord is getting at in our life in every season. Our progress in the Lord is geared more towards our internal life than it is when it comes to our works. It's very easy to focus on the works. It's very easy, especially if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, to focus on what you are doing for God rather than being intentional and focusing on what he's trying to do inside you. He's working on our internal life and our intentions if we're going to be prepared for eternal life. Let me make you this promise. If you prioritize your internal life, who you are on the inside, who you are before the Lord, by default, you'll grow in the anointing. By default. By default, you'll grow in effectiveness when it comes to your impact and your influence because what's on the inside of you eventually overflows on the outside. Good or bad, y'all. Come on. Good or bad. Out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth will speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, your actions will speak. So if by default you focus on becoming, being who the Lord has created you to be, the works will follow. The works will follow. Now, I just want to say this. You can gain results by pursuing those outward signs of success, by implementing the right strategies, by focusing on those leadership principles, by putting yourself around the kind of things that you wish to be associated with. You can find success like that. The only problem is that ambition, you can actually lose the thing that matters the very most, which is your soul. Pursuing the Lord, the issue with pursuing spiritual things, even good things without inward change, 
is that we'll start focusing more on performance than being transformed. That is the danger of pursuing spiritual things or even good things without inward change. Is that we can lose our very soul. The reason I say this is Jesus clearly warns us. He says, listen, many will do wonderful works in my name. And he's going to declare to them, I don't know you. And here's what we learn about this. It is possible to do the works of Jesus without becoming like Jesus. It is possible to do the works of Jesus without knowing Jesus. And that's scary. That's a scary thought. Now, here's the deal. The gift and calling on our lives is irrevocable. That means what God designed you for, what he wired you for, you can do and you can function in. But the thing is, we want to function and do those things under the anointing. We want to function and not just be good at those things, but be anointed in those things. And again, be the kind of person that when God is looking at us, we are who we say we are on the outside and on the inside. By making becoming like Jesus our highest aim in life, you guard yourself against the pitfalls that would cause you to lose salvation, that would cause you to miss the most important thing, which is knowing him. Now, it's a mercy when we realize this, and I feel like it's something that maybe more mature believers often fall into. Uh, Becoming like Jesus is not some psychological phrase that we throw around in a Christian context. It's a deeply spiritual reality. In practice, that starts and from start to finish is worked by the Spirit of God. Our participation in this process is faith. Very simple. Our participation in this is faith. We become like Jesus only as we know Jesus. We become like him as we know him. So I just got a question for us this morning as we get into the word. Are you becoming or are you performing? Are you becoming or are you performing? All right, now here's the dangerous thing, right? We can perform in church. Church people like drama stuff. We like drama things. We like drama. We got, a, we got an eye for the dramatic. And what I want to say is this. It gets exhausting. You cannot live the Christian life without Jesus. You can't be a good person without Jesus. You might on the outside be able to change all kinds of behaviors But eventually the veneer will crack. And here's the thing. That's a mercy when that happens. And it's a process we all go through. So don't feel bad. I'm not outing anybody. Don't feel ashamed. We all go through it. At some point, we shift from trusting in Christ to trusting in ourselves. At some point, we begin to validate ourselves by our measure of spirituality versus the work of the cross. We have this temptation to drift away from this and God and his mercy begins to reveal to us when we're doing it by showing us who we really are. So I want to do a couple of things. I want to lay a foundation about how we enter into this transformation of becoming. We're going to look at two doctrines today, justification and inspiration. We're going to start with inspiration. Second Timothy three sixteen through 17. It says all scripture. Someone say all scripture. All scripture. By the way, that's the 66 books of the Bible. All right. This is what we mean when we talk about scripture is God breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly, someone say thoroughly Thoroughly. equipped for every good work. I like that word thoroughly because this is precisely what we want to address today. Now this should be a familiar passage for all of us. Uh, It's one of those on my list. I say every Christian should just have this etched in their heart. And from this passage, we get the basis of what we call the doctrine of inspiration. And what that means is that qualitatively, the Bible in its makeup is different than any other book in the world. What it means is that the Bible is indeed the very word of God. It's not a book of suggestions. It's a book of commandments that we were meant to follow, that are meant to be, uh, again, the thing that etches out the path that we, that we live in life. If you start following the Lord, he's going to narrow your life in to the bounds of the scripture. And your whole life experience could be explained through the scripture. What I love about this uh, translation, it says that these words are breathed out from God. They're God breathed. It's literally like how we use our breath to speak. These words in the Bible have been breathed out by God. 
Now, again, these words have been uttered through human vessels, but they carried the very inspiration of who he is as they penned these words. So that means this, the Bible's authoritative, it's truthful, it's effective, and instructs us in every area of our life. The highest authority in any church is the word. The highest authority in any church is Christ, because Christ and his word are synonymous. Again, the Bible is not man's thoughts about God. It's, man, it's God's revelation to man about God. Did you catch that? The Bible is not man's thoughts about God. It's God's revelation to man about himself. Which is why it is, again, the word of God. A spiritual text. Word and spirit. So again, that's that word that these words were breathed of God is the same word of Uh, In Hebrew, where it says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. That means that the Bible has the ability to impart to us spiritual life. It's not stagnant. It's alive. Now, the spirit does a work in us to change us. And that work is always going to be in agreement and in alignment with the Bible. So if you want to measure, again, the validity, right, the truthfulness of what God is doing in your life or anyone's life, because the moment we start moving away from this foundation, a lot of weird things happen. All right, so I'm just saying, if you're going to be transformed, if you're going to be changed, if we're going to be becoming more like Jesus, the scripture is the context that the Lord is going to use to bring that transformation. If we want to know the aim for which our spiritual development is to strive, we are to turn to the scriptures, not comparing ourselves to each other, not comparing yourself to your favorite preacher, pastor, godly person, you know, to the scriptures. The Bible is a mirror that will reveal to us the truth of our spiritual depth or lack. The scriptures are the spiritual chisel file and hammer that the Lord will use to shape us because it's the most truthful book you can read in the world. The reason why it's tough to read the scriptures is because it reads you. You read it and you go, oh, I'm falling short here. You read it and you go, oh, this is not a reality in my life yet. Again, because it's not a reality that we can orchestrate. It's something that the spirit bursts in us as the word opens us up to it and brings faith to us. Now the passage tells us how this shaping happens through teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, which will make us effective for work. Now notice all the things that happened prior to working, teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. That's all going to happen as we spend time in the word. And as we, again, as a community come around the word of God, The outworking of being thoroughly equipped for every good work is this shaping that comes through God's living word. Now, some of us wonder why we're not hearing from the spirit more. Who's ever wondered that? There are seasons where I'm not hearing from the Lord as much. You know why? Because I have not been in the word as much. Now, here's the thing. What the spirit speaks to us will always be consistent and congruent with what's in the Bible. He will never say something to us that is not. We're not giving the spirit enough to work with because the Bible tells us in John that he is going to remind us of every word that the Lord has spoken. All right. So as we're in the scripture, the scripture becomes the foundation, becomes the impetus, becomes the space that gives us life for us to hear from the spirit. So get your neighbor and say, give the spirit something to work with. Give him something to work with. Get in the word. Sometimes by his mercy, he'll speak to you if you're lacking in your knowledge of the word, but it's always going to be to drive you to the scripture. That is our foundation. Another passage that connects to this idea of inspiration is Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The sword of the word has this ability to shape our inner life and our outward actions. All right, we see this present in this passage. The Bible is the word of God that will simultaneously cut away at our sin, cut away at those areas in our life that are not pleasing to the Lord, and heal us and bring into our life what we need from God to walk it out. 
It says it penetrates soul and spirit, that's inside, joints and marrow, all right, flesh, thoughts and intentions. We've got to let the Word of God check us, even in, again, that inner life. Now, the theme I want to lean into is what happens as we begin to change, as our behavior is transformed, as our hearts are transformed. And the reason why we're being changed is so that we could become righteous. That is what our spiritual shaping is aimed at. Righteousness is a major concern for the Lord. The Bible tells us that the reason why Jesus had to come in the first place is because we've fallen short of God's righteous standard. Someone just say righteous. That is the issue with humanity. Unrighteousness. We see that in the beginning of Romans. So what does it actually mean to be righteous? Maybe we don't think about this very much. I'm starting to think about it a little bit more. What does it mean to be righteous? Google will tell you it's about being morally right or justifiable. Is that anyone? The Lexham Bible Dictionary says the quality of being in accordance with God's law. Old Testament, the Bible says when somebody was righteous, it was usually because they were someone who feared God. That was the standard of righteousness. Now, in the New Testament, we see a whole new dynamic that Jesus introduces about righteousness. We should be concerned about this again because it is the standard for which God has called believers to live, to live righteously. Now, we see all those things and those definitions about what that is meant to look like. We're called to live in a way that's morally right and justifiable in accordance with the laws of God. Now, think about this. I want to take a look at one of Jesus' statements in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 20. He says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Ouch. Quite a statement from Jesus. This is the standard, he says, for those who are going to be entering into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Pharisees get a very bad rap in our era just because we see how Jesus treated them. And we view them through the lens of those interactions and also our Western Christian perspective. The Pharisees were the people group that Jesus had the most criticism for. Just a warning for those who feel a call to ministry. All right? Because these were the ones who represented God to the people. And Jesus had the most criticism for them. And this is one of the only, maybe only, positive statements we see Jesus make about the Pharisees. The modern-day equivalent of the Pharisees would be like your favorite well-known preacher, teacher, uh, the person who you admire the most in the faith, who you just think is godly, like as soon as they die, you know they're going straight to heaven. Jesus says, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Maybe it's even some saint that uh, you venerate in in an appropriate way um, in the faith. The most godly person you can think, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds that, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this would have been a striking statement for the first century audience that Jesus was speaking to because the Pharisees were the marker. If you wanted to be close to God, you had to be like these people. They were the standard of the righteousness at that time. You don't get any higher than that. Now, the the Pharisees, they were well-versed. In the written and oral law of God, they memorized Torah. They could recite it uh, from heart, line for line, the memory and their memory of the law of God. They were meticulous and methodical in how they followed God's law and enforced it. And we see Jesus employing throughout the Sermon on the Mount what we call hyperbole, the to stress the radical importance of these commands that He's giving. Setting a new standard for what it's going to look like to enter into heaven. Somebody just saying a word. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Now, Jesus made this statement so that we would know what it actually requires to walk in righteousness. And we see a new righteousness revealed under the new covenant. Morality is not necessarily the righteousness Jesus is talking about. The primary issue that Jesus had with the Pharisees was not so much their practice, but the heart posture behind it. They were performers. 
Oh, they were good performers. He said, you love to pray long prayers in front of people. You love to have the best seats in a synagogue. All right. This performance, this sense of my knowledge of what God says is more important than God. My practice, my, I read my Bible today. I prayed today. I did all these things. And that is what validates who I am in God. And they made the law of God more important than the God who gave the law. And that's what Jesus had to course correct. And I and have to say that many of us, we fall into that same trap. They assume that by keeping the law, they would be justified. And this is what I call living under the old covenant. And people are still doing it today. How do you know? You ask somebody, how do you get to heaven? They're going to say, I'm a good person. I keep, I keep all the laws. But do we? Anytime that we feel our actions and our behavior is what justifies us, we leave the new covenant of grace and come under the old covenant. The Pharisees, and I would say the majority of the world, seek to be justified by their adherence to the law. But if you do that for long enough, there's something you'll discover. No one is actually righteous. No one. We all mess up. We won't even keep the speed limit. <laughs> we all break the law. The law is not meant to be kept. All right. I'm not even going to embarrass anybody. If you've lied, just, just, make, just make a marker in your mind. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen? All right. Have you ever lusted in your heart after another person? All right. That's just three things. And I'm sure everyone in the room is like, check, check, check. The law of God reveals to us God's righteousness, but it also reveals to us our sinfulness and also our lack and our inability to keep that law. We see with the coming of Jesus and the coming of the Spirit a new righteousness that's being introduced. I wouldn't even say a new, maybe even a clear perspective around righteousness that always existed. Where does it come from? True righteousness is birthed. By trust and faith in the Son of God. Period. Woo! Set yourself free. Yay! No law. That is the craziness of the gospel. That is the wild and radical freedom that God introduces us with when it comes to the gospel. Is that it's not about our works. It's about his work. It's about what he's done. And the Spirit leads us under this new covenant. So that true righteousness is birthed in us by faith, by Christ being alive in us and not necessarily by our works. Now, there will be good works. But it's the heart posture that matters the most to God. Who we are, why we're doing it, why we're even saying it. Romans 3, 21 through 24 it says, but now apart from the law, someone say apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. To which the law and the prophets testify, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Level field. Everything's level now. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. What's his glorious standard? Righteousness. All are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So we want to talk about becoming righteous. First thing we want to do if we're going to become righteous, die to your performance. Die to it. The Spirit is going to... Listen, moments where we are awakened to the fact that we are performing and we're not actually believing, we're not actually... Um, well, what I want to say, we're not walking in orthopathy, all right, which means right feeling. Things are not... We're saying the right things, we're doing the right things, but our heart is not aligned. Okay, orthopathy has to do with the inside. That is a sign to us to die. All right, how do we know we need to die to our performance? You need to die to your performance when you're seeking to justify yourself before people. All right, bragging and boasting about our accomplishments is often an indication of performance. It's a slippery slope, right? 
If you're sharing about what God's doing in your life in a way to encourage someone that you're speaking to, that's a blessing. If you're doing it so that they'll, you'll, they'll know you're more spiritual than them, self-righteousness, old covenant, not seeking validation through our works. Letting weakness be a sign of surrender to gain supernatural strength. Let me say that again. Dying to performance. Letting weakness be a sign of surrender so that you can gain supernatural strength. When we, ha- we have no ability to follow God without God. And there are moments where you're looking to follow the Lord and your weakness is revealed. And it's not a moment of shame, but it's meant to be a moment of surrender. To say, God, I can't do this. I need you to do it in me. It's a moment of surrender. You know, it's funny, you know, brokenness, uh, we like to say in the body, attracts healing, right? I broke my toe. So all the blood rushed in my body to my toe to begin to heal and mend the bone. When brokenness is revealed, we're not supposed to hide it in our spiritual life. We go to the healer because Jesus is attracted to that heal. He's attracted to bring healing to that, that place in our life. We often despise our weakness and inability to follow Christ, follow Christ well. But that weakness is, again, an invitation to die, to surrender our need to perform so we can be empowered by the Spirit for real. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is where dying daily comes in, y'all. You ever wake up and don't want to pray? Die. And let the Lord know. <laughs> And prayer will be a lot easier instead of trying to act like you want to pray. Trying to act like you want to read. Just, Lord, I don't want to read the word today. Help me to hunger for the things of you. And God strengthens you. You'll notice a shift right away. God is not for us trying to muscle through and make it happen. That's works. That's law. That's sweat of your brow. Right? Then he reversed the curse. Yeah. Grace now. No more curse. He became a curse for us so we could be blessed. Die to performance. Performance Christianity. Throw it out. Second thing you want to do, trust in Christ rather than yourself. The Bible says, do not lean on your own understanding. Trust the Lord with your whole heart. True righteousness does not originate with us. Righteousness comes through faith in Jesus. If righteousness could come for us, Jesus would never have had to come. Just like the Bible says about Abraham, it says he believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness because he knew that what God said, he could only give him the ability to do. Again, that belief in God and not in ourselves, that trust in God and not in ourselves does not undermine the confidence we should have. Again, our progress and our growth has less to do with our effort and more to do with his power working in us and through us. It's a surrender. All right, and we see this over and over again. This is something we never outgrow. We always come to a point of dying so that the life of Jesus can be made manifest in our bodies. Again, putting trust in Christ doesn't mean that our participation is fruitless it means we know where we're believing for. I'm not trying to make this happen to me. Last thing is this. Live by faith. Just look at your neighbor and say, live by faith. Live by faith. Just live by faith. And we know whose faith we're living by. Romans 1.17, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by the law. No. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Again, the reason why true righteousness comes from the gospel is because we know what righteousness requires. It requires something beyond ourselves. Again, this is why God sent us his son. This is why Jesus suffered brutally on the cross. He lived the life that we were meant to live perfectly and putting our trust in him causes us to become the righteousness of God in Christ. 
because Christ comes to dwell within us. Who believes that? Come on. He comes to live on the inside. That's why you can be made righteous. And again, it has nothing to do with losing the best parts of who you are. It's amplifying the best parts of who you are because now you're in communion and union with the one that you were made for. Again, as we live by faith in him, he lives through us and causes us to walk in his ways. To fulfill what Paul says, establishing the law. Again, we live by faith and the spirit empowers us to do so. To walk even as Jesus walked. So here's what we want to consider today. What is it? How is it we going to become more like Jesus? What does it look like for us to live righteously? How do we allow for righteousness, our righteousness, to far surpass that of the Pharisees? Trust in Christ. Trust in Jesus. Because Jesus' righteousness is far surpassing of anybody who we think fits that model. By methodically and carefully seeking to live a life where we are trusting in Christ and going after any space in our life where we're not. And saying, Lord, I need to surrender this to you. I've been thinking that... This is my thing that's making me feel spiritual, that's making me feel good about myself, other than you. We want to die to performance-based Christianity, that sense of measuring ourselves by our obedience and our works. The obedience and the works will follow, but the heart posture, y'all, this is what God's after. Who we are on the inside. No more performing but truly living a life surrendered in weakness, we're made strong. I'm preaching myself to y'all. Again, we're allowing for weakness to be our indication to draw supernatural strength from the Lord. Listen, if you're here this morning, maybe you don't know the Lord. Maybe this is your first time here and you're, and you're starting to seek out like, what is this Christianity all about? It's about living life with Jesus. It's about walking with Jesus. It's about having a relationship with him, allowing for him to guide your life because he has the perfect plan for it. I want to extend an invitation to you today to come out from under the law, to come out from under the old covenant. We can never justify ourselves. Listen, if you want to be saved from the fear of death, the simple answer is this, to put your trust in Jesus. Satan uses the fear of death to captivate people all their days to try to make the most out of a short life rather than living for forever and the reality is this if you die in your sins without knowing the Lord you will pay the penalty for your sins he extends an invitation to us all day long to know him and I just want to invite you this morning to start that journey not to put it off any longer because not another day is promised to us Like if you do not know the Lord, if you want to know if this is real, not just something that people talk about, the Bible says that God is near to all, to all who call on him in truth. Ask him to reveal himself to you. Get right with him. Listen, you can have a great life, but what good is it if you die and and you're separated from every good thing that you ever enjoyed in this life? Because every good thing comes from God, whether we acknowledge him or not. I want you to make a decision, make a choice today to invite in the one thing you were created for, the one person you were created for, Jesus. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Come Holy Spirit. Listen, I just want to take a moment. I don't want to breeze past this. It's so simple. So many of us in this room, we've already made that choice. I made that choice 14 years ago best decision of my life would have never imagined the good things that God had prepared for my life. We all know that there's something great that God's preparing us for. We just don't know how to get there. We get there with Jesus. He is the way. If you're in the room this morning, you do not know the Lord. I want to extend the invitation for you to know Jesus. If you'd like to do that, just raise your hand. Don't worry about the people around you. I want to pray for you. In fact, I want to pray with you to accept Jesus Christ. The Bible says when you do this, you'll be born again. He'll give you a new heart. He'll soften you. He'll make you sensitive to the things of the Spirit. If there's anyone else, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Don't worry about the people in the room. 
This is about you and Jesus getting right with Jesus. Hallelujah. So brother, just pray with me. Just say this in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose from the dead so that I can be saved. I repent. Repentance simply means you're turning from your own way and turning to God. I repent of my sins, and I receive you as Lord and as Savior. I put my trust in in you. Now, if you said that prayer, I just want you to put your hand on your heart. Just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. The promise that for those who've received Jesus is that you would receive the Holy Spirit. He would abide with you forever. Just say, Holy Spirit, fill me. And keep asking until you feel that touch, feels like light, feels like fire. You'll feel some kind of sensation come upon your heart. That is the presence of God coming to take residence inside of you. Our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you. Lord, I pray for my dear brother who said that prayer, that you would seal, seal your spirit upon him. Put the seal of the Holy Spirit upon him. Anyone else in the room, Lord God, who's receiving you right now for the first time, Put the seal of your Holy Spirit upon them and mark them for great things. Doesn't matter how long you've waited. You could have been messing around your whole life, but now you're saying, I need to get right with God. God can do more with a little than he will with a lot. So Lord, I just pray that the best days would be ahead and not behind. And that Lord, you would make yourself extremely, extremely clear to those who received you today in Jesus name. Listen, we wanna end with some worship. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. If you would like prayer, if you wanna come up here to the altar and surrender performance Christianity, don't be ashamed. You can come here and lay it down and say, God, I'm gonna pick up my cross. I'm gonna pick up my cross and follow you. I'm gonna die to myself. If you want anyone to pray with you, we'll have prayer team up front to pray with you as well. But we wanna surrender that performance Christianity so that we'll live by faith and actually become the righteousness of God in Christ. Let's worship.
20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord, we thank you for taking up residence in each one of us. Lord, we thank you for changing us, for transforming us, for giving us a heart of flesh. God, for giving us a new mind, for giving us your spirit. Lord, I pray, mark us today to commit ourselves to walking by faith and living in this body by the faith that we would have in the Son of God, even as you love us and gave yourself for us. Lord, we pray, bless us, keep us, God. Make your face to shine upon us, God. Let your favor arise over your people and keep us, God, and give us peace. Lord, we pray, be with us until we gather together again. We ask this all right now in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Listen, thank you for being here this morning. We've got one more message in this series. Come out next week. Invite somebody. Hang out. we got our mission luncheon happening down in the gym. We're going to have a good time learning about all things mission here at the crossing. Bless you.